you are linked with the one who made you and crafted you and, and knows everything about you, your every bone, every aspect of your life, he knows. He has called you. He is taking you places. He is leading you and guiding you and blessing you so that you can be a blessing to others. invites you to a special pastor seminar at AFT Chennai on the 20th, 21st and 22nd of January 2016 from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Please note that all messages will be in Tamil only. Prior registration with a fee of rupees 700 is required. You can register online at www.refsam.org or you can call us at the numbers on the screen. We look forward to seeing you there. There is great value to human life. But when does that value get established? At what point is man valuable? After his birth? After he's born, is he valuable? The Bible says that human life has value from the time of conception. Mother Teresa, all of you know, has done a great work in Calcutta and around the world. Uh, worked with children a lot, helped children a lot. When she was in America in 1994, she was asked to speak at the National Prayer Breakfast, an event that happens in Washington, D.C., for people in the government, the elected officials like senators, congress, and uh, secretaries, the ministers of the government, including the president and vice president, all of them attend the prayer breakfast. Usually some very famous person is invited to speak. And... Um, she was invited that year to speak. This is an elite crowd, very powerful, some of the most powerful people on the whole face of the earth, seated there. And she was standing there and they say, you could hardly see her face because the podium was bigger than her, you know. She was just taking out her head and speaking through that, that simple woman standing before, behind that pulpit. But she carried such authority because she has done such a good work. And as she spoke, everybody listened with rapt attention. And she said this. She was talking, she all, she somehow talking about uh, things. She went into the uh, subject of abortion. She said this, abortion is war against the child, a direct killing of the innocent child. Murdered by the mother herself. If we accept that a mother can kill her own child, how can we tell other people not to kill one another? 
Now, in the 70s, they made abortion legal in America. And since then, people have taken utmost advantage of it, you know. For any and every reason, they started getting, uh, you know, this abortion done. You know, if they didn't like to have a child, just abort, you know. It's no big deal. You know, they take it very lightly, you know. I know that for medical reasons, uh, many times it's needed to be done. But then people started using it for every reason, you know, left and right for their convenience, started using this facility because it's become legal now. And, and the whole nation was talking about it. It's become a big issue, and a lot of Christians were objecting to it and so on. And in that context, Mother Teresa spoke. And she said, that's murder, that's killing, and uh, how can you pass a law saying that you can, uh, this is allowed, but uh, you can't kill one another, you know. You're killing a baby. And, but you can't kill one another. How can that be possible? Then she continued. She said, please don't kill the child. I want the child. Please give me the child. I'm willing to accept any child who would be aborted and to give that child to a married couple who love the child and be loved by the child. From our children's home in Calcutta alone, we have saved over 3,000 children from abortion. These children have brought such love and joy to their adopting parents and have grown up so full of love and joy. Now the issue, see, this is just an example. Abortion is just an example. I'm not trying to talk about abortion here. So don't get diverted thinking about abortion. Abortion is only an issue. But the larger issue about which this is an illustration is the issue of value of human life. That's why we are referring to abortion here, uh, to Mother Teresa's statement here. She says, uh, don't kill that child. Give me that child. I will raise that child. I will take that child and give it for adoption somewhere. She'll grow, that child will grow up uh, in a good surrounding and bring such great joy. We have done this to thousands of children, she says. Why is she interested so much in saving lives? Some people are just easily killing lives. While this woman is so interested in saving lives, goes all over the world, pleads with people, says, don't kill that child. If you don't want the child, give it to me. I will take the child. Why is she interested in saving the life of a child? Because she has this Christian ideal that comes from the scriptures of the value of human life. Now, I'm sure that a lot of people value human life after the child is born. Once the child is born, you have no problem. And everybody says, yeah, human life is valuable, you know. Uh, take care, you know, don't kill the child or something like that. But they think when the child is still in the womb, it's not so. It has no value. You can do it. That's the issue. And the Bible teaches, in Psalm 139 and other passages, the Bible teaches, since God puts his hand on us, and carves us, sculpts us, designs us, and fashions us from the time we are in our mother's womb in the earliest stages of conception. Therefore, therefore, value begins at the time of con conception, not at birth. This is the biblical idea. And that is why Mother Teresa is insisting that the children should not be adopt, I mean, aborted uh, after they're conceived in the womb because she gets this idea that their life is valuable and what establishes the value? God created the child. God has fashioned, formed, sculpted, and has a purpose for this child. Therefore, the child should not be taken lightly and, uh, and aborted. All right, fifthly, before you were born, God knew your purpose. Purpose so, is so important in life. Before you were born, God knew your purpose. Jeremiah chapter 1. See, God established the value of your life even when you were in your mother's womb. You were precious to God. You're highly valuable to God. Why? Because He fashions, creates, makes and makes you with a purpose, designs you for something. That's why you carry so much value. Your children, as they're conceived in the womb, and as they grow there, they have already value, great value. They're precious in the sight of God. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. 
Look at what he says to Jeremiah. Now, Jeremiah is called for ministry, to call to be a prophet. But Jeremiah thinks God has made a wrong choice. He's telling God, God, you better seek, think over it second time. Because I'm not a man who can talk well and all that, you know. I'm just a child. Why do you want to send me? I can't do this. As if God didn't know what he was, you know. The thing is, God is saying, I know everything about you because I fashioned you. I made you. Don't tell me you can't be a prophet. Don't tell me you are a child. Don't tell me you can't talk. Because I fashioned you, sculpted you, designed you, made you for this, to be a prophet. When you were in mother's womb, before you were in your mother's womb, I knew you, he says. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you as a prophet to the nations. Three th four things are said. I formed you. I knew you. I sanctified you. I called you. I ordained you. Formed you is what he did in the womb. Knew you is knowing everything about him as an individual, as what he will be and become and what he will do and so on. Sanctified you means to set apart him for a purpose. Set him apart for a purpose. And ordained you means to call him for a specific purpose. And Jeremiah says in the next verse, Oh God, Lord God, behold, I can't speak for I am a youth. <laughs> See, he's giving God his birth certificate, his handicap certificate, <laughs> doctor's certificate, everything. He says, God, I got some problems. Do you know about it? You haven't looked at my medical certificate. You haven't looked at my birth certificate. You haven't looked at any of these things. Normally, when you, when you take for a job, they'll want your medical certificate and, and uh, you know, all that stuff, uh, whether you have experience, young or old, or, uh, you know, you don't want to take a too young a person for this job. I'm youth, and I can't speak well. Don't you know that? God says, look, I made you. Don't bring your medical. I don't need your resume because I gave you the resume. I made you, I fashioned you. Don't bring that stuff to me. Don't tell me you can't do it, he says. But the Lord said to me, do not say I'm a youth, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. He says, I'll be with you because I have made you for this. I'm going to be with you and make this possible. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. He says, Now check your mouth. It will work. <laughs> okay, I've touched it. It didn't work before. Now see, it will work. Because I called you, I'll give you the ability to speak just like that. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Paul says later on in Galatians chapter 1, Paul's, a lot of people criticized Paul those days. Some of them said, well, Peter is an apostle, John is an apostle, James is an apostle. Don't believe this Paul. This Paul is not one of the original apostles. He's never be, he was never with the Lord Jesus. He was inducted later on, and, and he's not a true apostle like Peter and, and so on. So there was, a, there was an opposition to his claim of apostleship. And Paul is answering that and defending his apostleship in Galatians 1. One of the strongest defense of his apostleship is found in Galatians 1. And there he says, God knew me from my mother's womb and separated me for the gospel from my mother's womb and chose me. And did not consult with anybody because I knew that God made me for this and God raised me up for this and God has called me for that. You find that in one, chapter 1 in Galatians, verse 15 and 16. So, do you feel that sense? Do you have that sense like Paul had? Do you have a sense of God's call? You know, I remember back when I first started out, uh, you know, I was just have a, I, I, I just put up a hut here, right where the cars are standing there, uh, 80 by 40 hut. I did not even have a fan in those days. Four halogen lamps in four corners, pathetic looking, looking thing, you know. And, and no floor, nothing, you know, just put a cement stage and stood there and I will sing and preach and so on. And the place got filled up, the, the hut got filled up. I put a little thatched hut around it, the flat hut, you know, around this hut, you know. And that also got filled up and things were happening and so on. One day, 
there, there, was a, there was an American couple that were coming here to church quite often. They were missionaries here at that time. This was back in the 80s. And uh, that, uh, the lady called me one day and she said, listen, Brother Ralph Mahoney is here. Can, you, can I bring him to your church to preach today? I was getting ready for church Sunday morning. She calls me and asks me if he, she can bring Ralph Mahoney. And Ralph Mahoney, I knew who he was. He was the head of an organization called World Missionary Assistance Plan, World Map. He was the board member in the college where I studied and so on. He was the graduation speaker the year I graduated from college. I have never spoken to him, but I've seen him from far, you know, from the audience. That way I know him and that he's a big guy, you know, who's a wonderful preacher. I couldn't believe he was going to come to our church and preach here uh, because he was friends with this uh, person here. So she brought him here. And he spoke in that little humble hut, you know. He looked around, he wondered, you know, he said, what is this guy doing here? And, 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 and he preached there. <laughs> and he preached a wonderful sermon, I still remember. He preached an amazing, amazing message. And at the end of his message, he prophesied for about 10 minutes. <laughs> he just prophesied and said things like, unbelievable. I mean, you would have dismissed it. He said, and I kind of, I just, didn't want to know what to think of it. He quoted verse 10 here. Uh, See, I have uh, this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down, to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. He said exactly these words. And I was not in a mood to root out or pull down or destroy or throw down. I was just trying to barely make it, you know. I'm not a, you know, I was nobody, you know, I just, 30 years old and I'm just, uh, you know, just trying to barely get by with what I had and trying to do some ministry and slowly things are working out. He said, you are called to do that. And he said, I can see people here from one corner of this compound to another corner. There is no place, people, heads of people I see all over this compound filling this place. That many people standing in that hut, he says that. How could a man imagine that? <laughs> I can see that, he says. Then he said, from here, the gospel will go forth to the world. The whole world, he said. <laughs> now, it sounds nice now, a little bit better maybe. A <laughs> little bit better maybe. Now you can, yeah, I can see that. No, in those days, I couldn't see that, you know, because how will the gospel go from here? There was no cable television. There was no satellite television, none, none of that stuff. There was only one channel, Durdarshan. And uh, so how is he talking about, I mean, TV didn't come into my mind at all. That was not a possibility at all. He said, the world, the whole world, the gospel will go from here, he said, from this place. I said, my God, this is unbelievable. I, you know, I, I didn't think of it too much. But as the days went by and things changed, I remember that now. And I believe more and more that God saw me in my mother's womb and took me by his hand and crafted me and fashioned me and sculpted me and made me for this very purpose. I believe that with all my heart. And it has helped me through various struggles in my life because I believe that God truly loves me and he has his eyes on me. And therefore, when I faced difficulties and pressures and problems when I was put in a corner many times and faced all kinds of difficulties and challenges when I thought I couldn't make it anymore I always relied on this that I am in God's hands from the time I was in my mother's womb God made me for this crafted me for this called me for this he told me to go he put his hand on my mouth and made me speak he gave me the words he gave me the anointing he gave me everything therefore if it will happen doors will open things will change barriers will be removed success will come I believed it and it's important see I'm just giving you my example because that's all, that's all I have you know because when I read Jeremiah that comes to my mind but it's true for you also God before God formed you in your in your mother's womb God knew you not only did he knew you he formed you he knew you he separated you for something gave you a unique job unique thing for which you are called 
That's why the most important thing in life is to know God because he's the one that he's the only one that knows who you are and what you're called for. See, a lot of people don't even know what they're called for because they don't know God. And when they come to know God, they think of it very religiously. Have you taken baptism? You know. That's all Christianity is all about. They make it look like, you know. Oh, have you taken Oh, yeah, I have taken baptism, yeah. Have you got the certificate? Yeah. Have you given the name in the church? Have you got your membership? Yeah. So what? <laughs> Christianity is something more than that. Christianity is where through Jesus Christ you come into contact with God and you and God are together. You are linked with the one who made you and crafted you and, and knows everything about you, your every bone, every aspect of your life. He knows he has called you. He is taking you places. He is leading you and guiding you and blessing you so that you can be a blessing to others. So don't look at it in a religious way. Oh, I go to this church. I took baptism there. And I'm a member there. That's not the thing, you see. Are you connected with Jesus Christ? The one who sculpted you and made you. Do you know why you are here? Do you know what you're made for? Is he leading you by taking you by your hand? Is he with you? I believe he is with me today. And I believe that he'll be with me till the last day of my life. He'll take me where I need to go and help me do what he has called me to do because I'm in his hands. Amen? Sixthly, he knows your potential. Before you were born, God knew your potential, your hidden abilities. See, abilities are often hidden, you know, but God knows it. Genesis 1.26 says, let's make man in our image and likeness. Let them have dominion. So God made man in his image and likeness. Made them as male and female, verse 27 says. What does that mean? It means that man is carrying the image of God, the likeness of God in some way, that whatever he does is a reflection of God himself. When he loves his children, when he loves his family, when he loves others, it's a reflection of God. When he works in this world, does things, it's a reflection of God. It is reflecting God. When he changes problems and difficulties, He's taking dominion. He's a reflection of God. God has dominion over everything. He has given him dominion. He's reflecting God. He feels love. Why? Because he's a reflection of God. He has a moral nature. He believes in right and wrong. He can't do wrong and sleep peacefully. Why? Because that's a reflection of God. You see. So you have possibilities beyond your wildest imagination. You are made with possibilities. You are made with potential. God knows your potential. You see, the other day I was telling about this guy who wore John 3.16 below his eyes. His name is Tim Tebow. He's from the U.S. He plays football, American football. For American football, you got to be a different size, you know, not like the soccer, you know. But if you hear the story, his story, you'll be amazed. His mother and father were living in Philippines at one time, and during the time they lived here, lived there, the mother uh, was infected with some kind of a infection that uh, was so dangerous, and she went into coma actually. And some strong drugs were given to her, and she recovered. And for a long time, she had to be on that medication. And during the time that she was on medication, she became pregnant. And the doctors told her to uh, do away with the child, you know, about the pregnancy because, uh, you know, the drugs would have affected the child's life. So she decided from that day on to stop the medication that she was taking. That's her decision. I'm not saying everybody should do that. She stopped the medication and she decided to have the child instead of aborting the child. And the child was Tim Thibault, who became a very famous star football player in America because he wore John 316 below his eyes. 90 million people Google to find out what John 316 is all about, you know. 
He grew up, he was born in, 18, in 1987 and grew up as a six foot three inch tall big man who could play football, uh, American football, you know. So potential. When he was born, they say he was puny. They thought uh, something's wrong with this guy. You know, he's puny, little, but he was healthy. And uh, they thought he'll be a puny little child, but he grew up six feet, three inches tall. All the potential came out just in a few years. <laughs> he started looking so different and accomplished the things that God had crafted him and made him for. Amen? Finally, God knows even before you were born, God knew your future, what your future is. This is a great consolation.